Welcome to Carp Tackle Tactics and Techniques. My name is Danny Fairbrass and over the next couple of hours we are going to give you a fantastic insight into modern day carp tackle and how to get the very best from it. We've got bivvies, bed chairs, rods, reels, line, rigs, bait, everything you're ever going to need and it's all the latest kit. And this is a big carp. We're at Maison de Lac Bleu in central France. Oh, it's very, very early spring, almost late winter. And we are here in search of the monster carp. This particular lake, Pirouet, has got over 100 fish in it and the average size, the average size is 42 pounds. So join us in a minute when I get this beast in and hopefully we'll be able to show you how big he is. Come on, baby. You are mine. Come on. Yes! In the net. What a result. A big maze on carp. Fantastic. And there he is. 39 pounds, 12 ounces of magnificent maze on mirror. Oh. Let's get this fella back and then start on that tackle. Oh, what a beast. The name Tracker is now synonymous with high quality bivvies and I think Chris Manifold, the designer of these, needs to get a medal for services to carp fishing for the armadillo and for the pioneer that we're going to show you later in the film. And it's no surprise that you'll see one of these in the background on all the filming that I do on Thinking Tackle and the underwater programs because I genuinely believe it's the best bivvy on the market. So in a minute we're going to show you just how quickly one of these goes up, all the unique features and all the bivvies in the range because there's quite a few of these now and after that we're going to look at the pioneer. The first thing, and it is only a small thing, but it makes a big difference, it comes in a bag big enough for the actual bivvy to go back in it. There's nothing worse than trying to roll the bivvy up and try and get it back in a bag that's slightly too small. So, big protective bag. Because the ground sheet's exactly the same size as the bivvy, you can lay it out in your swim first, get it facing the way you want it to be facing, and then the bivvy goes straight on top of it so it doesn't get muddy. When you lay the ground sheet down, make sure all these connections are on the underside of it. It's a high quality ground sheet that you get with a Mark II. And to get it in the right position, you want the tracker label at the front. That's where the door is going to be. And you can position it in your swim to exactly the angle you want the bivvy, because it's exactly the same size as the bivvy. And then lay your bivvy on top of it so it doesn't get dirty when you're setting it up. So just unfold the arms from the inside out, like that. It goes together really easily, the joints just push together, I've done the inside ones first and then the outside ones exactly the same. So I've clipped in at the other end first and I'll show you how you do it. Literally pick it up from underneath, put tension on the bivvy, clip it under that ring, that's it. That's now under tension. All the tracker bivvies come with really high quality pegs, which is a refreshing change. There's nothing worse than buying an expensive bivvy and getting a little bit of bent wire to put it down with. So, if all you need to do is grab the back ring underneath the ground sheet and the back ring on the back of the bivvy and literally just peg that down. And then you do the second pegging point at the back of the bivvy. And now you're going to see just how quickly it goes up. And this is the beauty of the armadillo system. Put your pegs in the front two eyelets and up she goes. And then on the second front peg, make sure you've got the door zipped down so you get the pegs the right distance apart. Grab your eyelet from underneath and in he goes. And then I'm going to do the back two and then the next one's round and the next one's round until it's completely done. And this is the major difference between the Mark I and the Mark II this pulch, or the chav peak as we call it. Your three poles go together as normal and then just slide through the little eyelets at the front. And 
and then they just push into these two male pieces at the end. to again put tension on it. And last, just put on your little spacer bar that comes with it just to push that porch out. And that makes a real big difference when the wind turns around and starts blowing in the doorway of your bivvy as it always does when you're fishing. This will stop your bed shed getting wet. Now this bivvy is made out of a material called Aquatex which has been designed in conjunction with Tracker. And the major difference between this and the other materials is that it doesn't expand and contract with hot and cold. Which means your bivvy doesn't go saggy in the rain and then really tight in the sun. And also it means the seams are not going to open and close so they're going to stay perfect for longer so the bivvy is going to last longer. So a major, major step forward in materials. And this is my claim to fame to do with the Tracker Armadillo. I asked the guys to put these clipping points a little bit higher on the door so it's not hanging down in front of you when you're looking out on the lake. And the difference between this one and the old Mark II are these mozzie panels on the side panels here. Really good for ventilation, obviously stops the mozzies getting through in the summer. If they're really bad you can have the door zip down and the mozzie panel open on that as well and you can still see the lake. And I find if it's pouring with rain, these panels don't really let the rain through that much. It will drip in a little bit, but when it's absolutely lashing down and you still want to be looking at the lake, that's what you want to be using. An optional extra to this system that I use all the time are these spacer bars. And they make the bivvy even more secure. Not that it's actually needed, but it just makes it all nice and tight and I fish with these in anything from no wind to a proper full seven on a great big pit like Shanty Co in France and the bivvy has stayed put the whole time. And the nice thing about these is in the daytime when it's sunny like this I'll take them off other than the bottom one and have the bivvy right down so it's folded completely back so I'm in the open air, airs the bivvy out, you can see more of the lake and then when it comes to the evening I'll just put them back on again and the bivvy's up again. So really, really versatile, they weigh nothing and go on just like that. So that's the Mark II, there are several other bivvies in the range, let's go and have a look at those. This is the Mark III Armadillo, or Trident as it's called, and it's got quite a few different features to the Mark II. The first of these is the Chav Peak that stops the rain coming in. This will completely zip off if you want it to. And also, these side panels, you can roll them back and fish with them rolled back just like a Mark II, or you can completely zip them off, so you've got a completely open front. One of the other differences is it's only got three poles rather than five, so it packs down into a much longer, slimmer bundle, so it'll go into a quiver. And it also gives a nice curve to the bivvy and keeps it nice and low. So if you're into low bivvies, this is the one for you. Now this is only available in one man. Unlike the Mark II, which you can get in two man, this will only come in one man, but the Mark II wraps will go on it. So a one man Mark II wrap will take it to there, and you can even get an extended one man Mark II wrap, which takes it out to here. So you can turn it from a one man bivvy into two man bivvy if you're going with a mate just for a couple of nights. So this is probably the most versatile one in the range. It's the top end bivvy. If you can spare no expense, this is the one to have. So let's have a look at a few of the others in the range. And if you're on a real tight budget or you're only doing nights in the summer, this has got to be the bivvy for you. It's called the A-Light and as the name suggests, it's very, very lightweight. It's three poles, just like the Trident, so it goes up really, really easily. And it comes with a lightweight ground sheet, which to be honest, I wouldn't use. I'd just use a tensioning strap. That's exactly what I do on my Mark II. And to be honest, if I knew this was in the range before I got the Mark II, I probably would have got this one instead. The flaps come down at the front to keep it all tense and then you get spacer bars as well to make it even more rigid. So if you want, you can roll those back so you get a full view of the lake. So if you're just doing overnighters, this has got to be the one. And last, and by no means least, it's the Ultralight Pioneer. This is another Chris Manifold creation. It's basically a brolly and the bivvy combined, but without the inner spokes of the brolly. So you've got a massive area inside it. And the major, major bonus of this is how quickly it goes up. Literally, you just fan it out on the high quality ground sheet, put the two poles in, pull them together, it's up. So if it's pouring a rain when you get to the lake, your shelter is up in seconds. And there's loads of different options of how to fish it. You can fish it with the infield panel, that just zips on and off, and you've got mozzie bits there as well, so you can still see the lake if it's red hot and there's loads of mozzies about. And then if you want, you can zip the whole thing off, take the poles off. If there's not a breath of wind like we've got today, you can see the whole lake through it and you don't even need the poles to hold it up. 
Now, if you don't want the all singing or dancing, which is this one with the poles and everything included, you can get the specimen version. It goes up in exactly the same way. It's the same bivy. It's not using the Aquatex material, but it's still a waterproof breathable material. You still get the infield panel with it. You just have to buy the poles separate. So if you're doing quick sessions, you're doing overnight, as a lot of the top boys, Tom Dove, Adam Penning, um, Ali Hamidi, they all use these in England. If they're just doing overnighters, it's up in seconds and you're angling. Now that we've looked at bivvies, we're going to look at bed chairs, and this is the Dyer Infinity version. First of all, it's got an integrated pillow, which means you don't have to take your own one with you. It's in a lovely carpy green colour, and it's an anti-rip material, so it's going to last a long time. It's got three legs, and when I'm fishing three legs, I have the third one set, so it's nice and flat for sleeping, so I don't actually use the ratchet. I only use that when the back of it's up, and I'm using it as a chair. It's got nice padding over that as well, so you don't hurt yourself in the night. And also that nice little feature there for keeping your personal belongings like your glasses and stuff in. You'll see it's very, very low to the ground. It's got special legs to keep it really, really low. And it's got mud feet on it as well. And having a low bed chair means you can see out your bivvy a little bit better. It's very wide, but this is the beauty of it. It's very, very light as well because the whole framework is made of aluminium. So a superb product. And these are the bed chairs that are available from Tracker. This is the three leg version. It's got the integrated pillow, very, very hard wearing material. It's got the lovely bit of padding all around the outside so you don't rub against the ratchet in the night. It's also extremely low to the ground and it's also got a nylon front to it. So if you get your muddy boots on there, you can wash it straight off. And it's also very, very lightweight. There's a two leg version in the range as well, which is ever so slightly heavier and it doesn't have the pillow, but that's reflected in the cheaper price. And all three bed chairs represent excellent value for money. There's nothing worse than being cold when you're fishing, but Tracker have got that covered. This is the big snooze. Believe it or not, it's the cheapest one in the range and it's still got a lovely fleece inner to it. It's got quite a nice loft on it. It's a probably a three to four season bag. And if you use one of their bed chair covers over the top of it, you could use it in winter as well. It's got what we call crash zips, fast release zips, or when you want to burst out of it, you can get straight out of the bag. And it's got on the top of it and the bottom, it goes around the top and bottom of the bed chair and it's got a strap in the middle so it stays put when you get out of the bag. And next up is the legendary Big Z. You can see straight away, this is a five season bag. The loft of that bag, that's how much air the material inside traps is huge. That's going to keep you warm whatever the weather. This is the real tree version for all you camouflage nutters out there. There's a normal green version as well. It's got the same bust open zips. It's got the same hood on the back and the front to keep it on the bed chair and the strap in between. And if you want to go absolutely mental, you can put a real tree cover over the top of it as well and keep it 100% waterproof too. And I use those covers all the time because when it's pouring with rain and you get out the rain into your bivvy and sit on your bed chair, the water will go straight through it. So if you use a waterproof cover, it will save that happening. And last and by no means least, it's the top of the range. It's the new Armo Tech sleeping bag. And that takes its name from this covering. It's fully waterproof, fully breathable, and it'll even wick the sweat away from your body if you get too hot in the bag. And that's coupled with the latest thermal lining to hold in as much heat as possible. So this is definitely a five season bag. It's got the same hood on either end to hold it on the bed chair and the strap in the middle. And you can even get a cover to go on top of this to turn it into a six season bag. So if you want to sleep out in the open, like some nutters do, this is the one for you. This one comes in its own waterproof bag because it is the top of the range and the other two come in stuff sacks. And I've used tracker sleeping bags for the last few winters and they haven't left me wanting. As you may or may not know, I am a Daiwa devotee. So obviously Daiwa were the ideal people to involve in this project. And I'm now playing a fish on a 12 foot, three and three quarter infinity, which may sound like a beast of a rod if you're not used to fishing with stiffer rods. But believe me, it's not. It casts an extremely long way but it's still got quite a soft tip and I actually prefer to use a stiffer rod if I can because there's always something left in the rod for you. If you use a very, very light rod, the rod's bending all the way through to almost the handle and you're not putting any extra power on the fish. Here I'm just bending the tip section of the rod and if I want to give it more, I will do. And when I've got this beast in, we're going to have a look at the infinities. I'm going to show you all the different features that make them 
probably, in my opinion, the best rod on the market. People often ask me, when are Calder going to do rods? And my standard response is, when Calder can make a rod better than Daiwa can make a rod, we're going to do rods, which effectively means we're never going to do rods. I'm an Infinity X fan, as you probably already know, and what we're going to do in a minute is go through the entire Daiwa range because there's rods to suit every budget. Now, a lot of people say, oh, Daiwa rods are too thick at the butt, you know, they don't suit my fishing, they're too stiff. Well, you've just seen a fish being played on a 12 foot, three and three quarter rod, and you saw it was very forgiving under the tip. So we're going to talk you through how to play fish as well and give you some casting techniques. I'm now going to buzz this rod out 120 yards. It's 16 pound pro clear line straight through. I've got a three ounce lead on and a little stick and a flying back lead and it's going to go out there and hit the clip with ease. So watch this go out there and then let's have a look at the range. Beautiful. So this is the range of Daiwa top end stuff and I'll start off with my favourite. That is the Infinity Advanced Magnum Taper. The real, real fast taper rod. And fast taper basically means that when it bends, it goes back straight again really, really quickly. So the line shoots through the rod with less resistance and that's what makes it cast further. And the thing about all Daiwa rods, they're very light in the tip. And that doesn't mean they're soft, it means there's no weight in it. So when you're holding the rod up, it doesn't feel any weight. And that's the, my criticism of other rods, is when you pick them up, they feel heavy in the tip. The heavier something is in the tip, the harder it is to move through the air. So these make long distance casting that little bit easier. So if we go down the rod from the butt first, I've had a hand in actually redesigning these. And what we've done first of all, on the end cap, we've got a lovely little Daiwa motif in a stainless end cap. And then down from there, you've got a much slimmer Duplon handle that's just, just curved out slightly, so your hand goes round that really lovely. And also, the handles are longer than most factory-built rods. And the reason for that is, the longer the handle, within reason, the easier it is to move the tip of the rod and the further you're going to cast. If your rods have got little tiny short handles on them, it's going to make it harder to cast a long way. Going up to the reel seat, that's a special Daiwa moulded reel seat in a matte finish. Looks really, really lovely on it, and a tiny little Infinity logo. What we've tried to do with these is take everything down so it looks more and more like a custom-built rod. And then going up to the butt eye, that's unique to Daiwa as well. It's a high standoff ring, so it's a long way away from the blank. And what that does is it keeps the line away from the blank so you don't get line slap on the blank, and if the blank's wet, it stops the line sticking to the blank as well. And the first eye on the tip section is also a high standoff ring, and then it goes down to normal single legs. And that's something else that we've kept on these rods, a single legs on the tip section of the rod. That makes the tip section lighter, and again, makes it easy to cast a long way. It's five eyes plus the tip, and the tip is one of those Fuji SIC anti-wrap round tips to stop it wrapping round on the cast. And all the rings on this rod are the highest quality Fuji SIC rings. So jewellery for carp anglers, as we say. Absolutely beautiful rings. Now, this rod comes in a 12 foot 3 and 3 quarter, which is this one. A 12 foot 3 and a quarter, which, believe it or not, are my light rods. And a 12 foot 2 and 3 quarter, which are the ones that I used to use in the underwater films parts 3 and 4. Really, really lovely rods for fishing up to 100 yards. And my mates on my local syndicate lake with braid are putting baits 180 yards with this rod. So a superb casting rod. Then down onto the reel, that is the Rolls Royce of carp reels. That's a Bazier, top of the range surf casting reel that again, Damien and myself have redesigned for the carp fishing market. If you're paying a lot of money for a reel, you've got to have a wooden handle on it. And we've taken all the fancy writing off of it and just put a few little carp touches on there. And one of the major things about this reel, you've got a quick drag spool. So that means is from there to there, that is a solid spool to free running in that much time. So there's no need for a bait runner system. There, half a turn, that's solid again. So you just undo it half a turn when you're fishing, and when you get a bite, you just turn it half a turn and you're onto the fishing reel. And these weigh nothing, these Bayesia reels. They're half the weight of a 6000T, which is the reel that I used to use. And again, a very light rod and a very light reel with a long cone spool is gonna cast a hell of a long way. So that's the first setup. Then if you're looking for something 
that's going to bend that little bit more. That is the next one. All the boys on the shoot have been looking at this rod and reel with envy. Starting off with the rod, it's an Infinity Slim Power, three pound test curve, and this is going to be the one I'm using on the next underwater film. You've got a lovely little stainless cap there on the butt, a bit of shrink tube, and it's a much, much slimmer rod than the Magnum Taper. It's more of a through action, not so fast taper, so it's not going to cast quite as far, but it's going to bend right the way through. A lovely reel seat, just tips off with a bit of stainless either side. And then onto the ringing, we've purposely made it different from the Magnum Taper. So you've got the normal rings on there, a 40 mil butt ring, the same as the Magnum Taper, three leg, and then single legs on the tip to make it nice and light. Really, really nice rod for fishing, probably up to about 100 yards, I would say, but for playing fish, it's gonna be beautiful. And then down onto the reel, well, that is a bit sexy. That looks like a Bayesia and an SS3000 of form some sort of futuristic love child. Look at that. That's a tournament ISO. That's available in a 5000 or a 5.5. The only difference is the depth of the spool. Very, very lightweight and just looks absolutely gorgeous. So that's the next one down. And then next up is the longbow. And believe it or not, this is about a third of the price of an Infinity and still a very good casting rod. Now this is available in three and a half, three and a quarter, three pounds, two and three quarters, and two and a half pound test curve. So whatever your type of fishing, one of these will suit. And Damien and myself, again, have redesigned these to make them look more like a custom built blank. So we've kept everything down to the, as minimum as possible. Just a nice little bit of whipping on the end there and a little tiny butt cap. The little longbow logo, I don't know if you can see that. And then a molded handle. And then again, five eyes and a tip, 40 mil butt ring, bound to a 16 mil tip ring. Really good recovery on these, and these are a favourite rod of Tom Dove, the young angler from the UK. He's got a set of Infinities and a set of these, and he uses these all the time because he likes them so much. And then going down to the reel, this is effectively my short range reel, believe it or not. These are my Entos that go on my three and a quarter Infinities. Very, very lightweight, just like the ISO and the Bayesia. Comes with different spools as well now. You can get quick drag spools for these. Beautiful reels, lovely clutch on them, and they look beautiful as well. And the last one is a longbow again, but on that, I've got a Tournament 5000C, probably the longest serving and best selling carp reel on the market at the moment. That's Terry Hearn's favorite reel. Tom Dove loves these as well. And there's a 6000T that I used to use before I got the Baziers, and the spool on the 6000T is about that long. It's massive, really, really good for casting, and they just look so carpy. And one other little feature that some of the anglers like is folding their handles in when they're actually fishing so they can get their rods even closer together for all you tackle tarts out there. So that's the high end stuff. That rod there, that Infinity, is actually one of my fishing rods. And as you can see, I've only got two out at the moment, so I'm gonna buzz that one out there and show you the other end of the range. If you're wondering why I'm a little bit slimed up, you're gonna to have to wait a little bit longer. We've got a little surprise for you a bit later on. But moving on to the budget end of tackle, you guys are so lucky. If you're getting into carp fishing now, the real good quality gear is so cheap by comparison to when I started getting into it. A carbon rod, the cheapest one on the market used to be 180 quid, and some of these are half that price or below. So if we look at this to start off, it's the old faithful longbow. I'd definitely fish with these. If I didn't have infinities, I'd be more than happy to have a set of three of those. And then moving on to the reels, that's an MCAST Advanced 5000. There's four reels in that range. There's a 6000 and a 55, which are the same size with just different depths of spool. And this is the smaller one, really nice and neat. And there's a 45 as well with a smaller spool. This has got 10 ball bearings in it. You know, and it's a budget reel. It's quite incredible. A few years ago, the best quality reels only had five ball bearings, and these have got 10. It's still got the air bale, so it's a very, very lightweight bale arm, but very strong, and a wooden handle as well. You know, and for all you tackle tarts out there, the handle will fold back so you can get your rods right next to each other. So really good quality, good line lay, excellent value for money. And then moving on to this fella, the MCAST EVO. There's four in the range again, the 6,000 and 5.5. And then the 5,045, this is the 5,000. And look at the styling of that. Beautiful black color, dark chrome and everything on it. Really nice rubberized handle as well and fantastic line lay. Air bale as well. And that's even cheaper than the MCAST Advanced. And if you're gonna move over to big pit reels and don't wanna spend a lot of money, 
that's got to be the way to go. That looks like a £200 reel and it's less than half that price. So fantastic value for money. And then if you want a bait runner, then the Regal BR Plus is the better one of the range. More ball bearings, got six ball bearings in this one. Nice styling as well. And if you're just getting into carp fishing and you want a bait runner reel, I'd say that's a good one to go for. That comes in four different sizes. We've got the 5004.5, and then the 4003.5 is a slightly smaller reel. So if you're floater fishing and that sort of stuff, the smaller ones are the one to go for. And then finally, we take you on to the ideal starter set. That's a Regal BRI reel. Really good value for money. That comes in four sizes, two larger ones, two smaller ones. Again, you could use those for floater fishing, the smaller ones. And the whisker rod, really nice styling for a low end rod. Nice bit of duplon on the end, very subtle markings on it. A little tiny whisker logo there. This really does look like a custom built rod. Molded handle, five eyes and a tip, just like all the others in the range. Really nice coning on the rings and good quality rings for the money as well. So if you were just getting into it, this would stand you in good stead for the first couple of years. This comes in two and a half, two and three quarter and three pound test curve. You notice quite a few of the reels we've put line on. There are four different lines in the Daiwa range. The classic sensor and sensor clear. That one's caught loads and loads of big fish. I think Lee Jackson had the record fish from England on that one. Very, very robust line. Very, very good value for money. And then move over, moving over to these other two. Infinity Duo, that's IGFA rated, which basically means it won't break above the stated breaking strain. So if it says 14 pounds or 12 pounds, that's the highest it will break at. So it's quite thin for the breaking strain. Most other lines are underrated, which means 10 pound breaks at 12 or 14, 12 might break at 15 or 16. And then you've got the Infinity HT, that's a much harder line than the Duo, so it won't cast quite as far, but it's got supreme knot strength. So if you're looking for knot strength and durability, that's the one for you. So now we've had a look at the rods and reels and lines, we're going to show you how to cast further. Casting a long way is all about having the right kit and using the right technique. We've showed you the kit, so this is the technique. And this is the thing that most people do wrong. They cast like this, and they're just casting just with their elbows. There's no body weight there, there's no power in it at all, and the rod's not going far through the power curve, which is 180 degrees. It's just going from there to there. In total contrast, if I extend that arm and then come down like that on I'm, I'm, I'm my back foot to start off with and then through the cast like that onto my front foot. Show you that again. From there through to there. That's using far more of the rod, far more of the power curve. So let's get a fishing rod and show you how it's done. Okay, so before I cast out, I'm just going to dip the tip in the water, just get the line wet and just lubricate the rings before I actually cast out. You want the drop on the rod, which is the distance from the tip of the rod to where the lead is, about half the distance of the rod. So roughly opposite the spigot of the rod, the join of the rod. Make sure your clutch is done up nice and tight. Bow arm open. And then grip the rod right at the end. That's another thing people do wrong, is they only grip the rod so far down, right at the end. The further apart your hands are, the easier it is to get the tip moving. So I'll just check the line's not tangled around the tip. Check behind me that there's nothing to get caught on. And out she goes. 120 yards with ease. When you're netting fish on your own, make sure that you pick the net up right at the very end when he's completely and utterly beaten. It's another very powerful maze or mirror on the end here. By the look of him, he's an upper 30 which is a baby for this lake, but he's very, very welcome. Just letting the rod absorb the lunges of the fish, keeping it up nice and high at this late stage. Push the net out into the margins, sink him down, and just be patient. Okay. 
Come on, baby. It's not ready yet. Come on, just get the rod for tip behind me. Just gently ease him in. Come on. Yes! In she goes. Top result. Oh, and there she is. Missed the magical 50 by just four ounces. But who cares when they look like that? What a beast. Let's get on with the show and show you some baiting techniques. The throwing stick is an extreme range baiting tool and it does take a bit of getting used to, especially this curved design. But once you get it right, the boilies will go an extremely long way. So to talk you through the easy stick to start off with, it's very, very light. That's the most important thing and that makes it much easier to move through the air. A long shaft with a J-shaped curve on the end, that's going to get the baits to lift. It actually causes backspin and the baits will lift in flight. And then a nice slim textured handle, long enough for two hands. I'm going to show you a single-handed technique and a double-handed technique as well. And to go through the stance, you want to be have your weight on your back foot. I've got a boilie caddy around my waist so I can get into a rhythm. And just one boil at a time to start off with. There we go. I'm just starting off on my back foot and then through onto my front foot. And the thing that most people do wrong with a curved stick, the baits end up in the edge because they're using their wrist all the time. You keep your wrist locked all the way through it and it's letting go there. And if you find you're chucking them into the edge, and when I'm teaching people to do this, they often do that, just aim at the trees above your spot. So don't aim at the marker float, aim high of it and they'll start to go out higher. And you know you're getting it right when the boilies start to lift in flight. Got a marker float about 100 yards out there I reckon. And these 18 mil baits are landing round that with ease. This is the reason for having a boilie caddy on. You don't have to keep bending down, you get into a rhythm. It's impossible to use a throwing stick and get really tight baiting, but if you're fishing with boilies, you want a nice spread of bait so the fish are moving around between each bait. Another mistake people make is they come across their body like that, and then the baits scoot off to the side. You've got to come straight up and straight down. And just like golf, get it to go straight before you get it to go long. If they're going straight, just work on your distance and you'll get further and further and further. Right, now the two-handed approach, literally exactly the same. It's more like a cast to use in one of these curved sticks. And what that does is it spreads the load over two arms and you can put more pressure into it. This is the Frank Warwick way of doing it. The more baits you do, the more you get into it and the further they'll start to go. And if your bait split out the end of the stick, you need to be drying them out for a couple of days before you use them and then they'll go out lovely. Practice makes perfect. In my opinion, using the marker float is an absolutely vital part of modern day carp fishing. One, it helps you map out the features in your swim so you know where to put a bait and two, it gives you something to aim at once you've found those features. So I'm going to talk you through my marker float setup. First of all, the reel. It's an Infinity X bait runner reel. Bit extravagant for a marker reel because it's top of the range, a fantastic fishing reel to be honest. But the reason I'm using it, it's got a great big spool, so the line comes effortlessly off of it, and also it's got a bait runner system on it as well. So when the marker floats out there, I can easily let the line off to find the depth of water. It's loaded with 20 pound tournament braid, and that's another key thing. You need to be using braided reel line on your marker reels because there's no stretching braid. So as you pull the lead along the bottom, what the lead bounces over is gonna vibrate better down the braid and give you a better idea of what's out there. And that's tied to a 30 pound calder armor called leader, and that's just to take the force of the cast. Again, braid, so you're not taking away any of the feeling whatsoever. And the rod is one of my infinities, a 12 foot three and three quarter infinity. Again, you might think a bit extravagant to have such an expensive rod as a marker rod, but if you can't cast your marker float as far as you can cast your rigs, it limits your fishing. Because if you can't get the float right the way out there, you can't see what's at the end of your casting range. So always have the best casting rod you've got 
as your marker rod. Even if it's not an expensive one, have a three and a half or even a four pound test curve rod as your marker rod because the stiffer rod's going to cast further and it's going to help you to feel more down the line. And moving over to the marker float setup itself, it's the new drop zone marker float from Calder. And the thing that makes it different from all other floats, it's very, very buoyant. It flies really well and it's got high vis veins on the top of it. This is the orange one. You get an orange and black in a pack or, your, or a yellow and black in a pack. There's nothing worse than when you get that float a long way out, you find a really sexy spot. Either the float won't come up because it's not buoyant enough or when it does come up, you can't see it in the ripple and that will combat all of those problems. And then the stem, is just a pike wire trace, a plastic coated wire trace that's got a quick link on the end of it and then at the other end it's got a cork ball to hold it up off the bottom even when the line's slack and a big eye swivel that I've crimped on as well and I've got a three ounce flat pair swivel on there and it's a flat lead on purpose because more of that lead's going to be touching the bottom so it's going to put more vibrations back down the line and tell me what's out there. So I'm going to whack that out and we'll see how to use a marker float. So I've whacked that float out, just out to the island in front of me. I've just tightened down, so now the float and the lead are next to each other. And what I'm gonna do is just very, very carefully pull the float back along the bottom. And as I do that, as the lead drags along the bottom, I can feel the tremors on the line. That's very, very smooth. So that would suggest to me there's, it's nice and clay out there on the bottom. Nice, smooth clay. I'm gonna do the same thing again, just pull it back a little bit more. Again, very, very smooth, not much resistance, so it's pulling across something smooth like clay. Now I'm going to wind back down so I'm pointing the rod at the float, and then I'm going to engage the bait runner system, so the, rod, the reel's now gone onto a free spool reel, and then I'm just going to pull a foot of line off, and I know that from here to extending my hand is roughly a foot of line. So that's one, two, three, four, and the float's up. So I've got a six inch long float, a six inch tail, so four plus the extra foot, that's five foot deep there. So I'm just gonna wind the reel to disengage the bait runner. I've pulled the float down to the bottom, and then very, very carefully, I'm just pulling him along the bottom again, and just again feels very, very smooth, hardly any resistance, and there's clay in the margin, so I know pretty much it's clay out there. So I'm gonna wind, the slack up, so I'm pointing at the float again, engage the bait runner, if you're just using a reel like the MCAST Evo, you'd undo the clutch and then just pull the line off from there, so again, one, two, three, three and a bit, so three and a half plus the foot for the tail and the float, that's four and a half foot, so that's come up half a foot there, so I know between that island and where the float is now, there's a little gully, and that'd be a great place to put a bait, just at the bottom of that gully. So I'm going to wind now to disengage the bait runner, pull the float down to the bottom, and then very, very carefully just pull the float along the bottom again. Okay, and then wind the slack down, so I pulled that float back probably six, eight foot now. Engage the bait runner. One, two, three. Well, three, three and a quarter. So with the float and the stem, four and a quarter. So it's just come up a little tiny bit. And just as I pulled back there, I felt a little tap on the rod tip, which tells me there might be some stones out there, might be some gravel. So I'm just gonna pull the float back down to the bottom and then pull it back. Still very, very smooth. So it's still clay out there. Winding back again and repeat the same. And it's worth doing this at the start of your session, especially if you're doing a week on one of these holiday venues. Map out the swim when you first get there. A week's a long time. You know, so if you know what's out there, you can start fishing after that. And once I've used the marker float once on that sort of session, it's very rare that I'll use it again. One, two, two foot now. So we've definitely come up. There's a bar there. We've come up a foot in just a short space there. So you've got a gully going down, gradual slope, and then up onto a bar. And if it's hot and sunny, like it has been in the last couple of days, 
that bar is a great place to have a bait, a bottom bait in two or three feet of water when it's really, really sunny is a great place to have a bottom bait because fish will come up into that shallow water. They might be swimming in mid water in four foot. They'll come onto two or three foot and you can get a bite there. So that's a great place to have a bait. Tap, tap, tap along the stones. And if you're going to put a rod on a gravel spot, don't put it right in the middle because that's what everybody does. So put it on the edge of a spot. If you can find what we call a seam between the silt and the gravel or the clay and the gravel, that bit where you first feel the taps, that's a lovely place to have a bait. So bait runner on. One, two, three, three and a half, so it's four and a half. So we're off the bar now, we're down the other side. So there's no point me putting a back lead on in this swim because it's going to go down to the bottom, over the bar, and then down the other side. As might as well just have a flying back lead on and try and keep the line pinned to the top of the bar and go it down at the other side. And that's another great place to have a bait. If you can lay the line down the back of something, it's much harder for the fish to come into contact with it. And if you're looking for spots on any lake, look for something different. So if it's silty everywhere and you can find a little gravel spot, great place to have a bait. If it's gravelly everywhere and you can find a little silt pocket, again, a great place to have a bait. And if you're going to fish the lake again and again, write it down. So you've got that swim mapped out. So the next time you go in there, you haven't got a cast around. But the first time you go out, as long as there's no one fishing around you, have a cast all around the swim, map out the features so you've got an idea in your head, and that's going to get you more bites. The days of taking your tackle over to the bank in a Tesco's carrier bag are gone. People like Dyer and Tracker have seen to that, and this is the dial range of Infinity Luggage. This is their high-end stuff. Starting off with this one, this is the large carry-all, and if you take everything and the kitchen sink, this is probably the one for you. Absolutely huge. We've got five pockets on the outside, two on that side, one long one on that side, and two at the front that I'd keep things like scales and sacks and all that sort of thing in. And then a massive cavity on the inside with more pockets as well, so you can fit your camera stuff and all your rig wallets and everything in there. So that is the all singing, all dancing. Then the next size down, that's the medium carry-all, just like the big and it's got nice carry handles on it. And then a padded strap as well. And that's the sort of thing I'd take all my cooking stuff in one of these, so I can get all my little bits and pieces in there but that'd be an ideal one if you're just doing sort of afternoons and stuff. And then this next bit of kit, this is quite a specialist bit. If we open that up, that's a cool bag inside there. So you can keep all your bait nice and fresh or your food nice and fresh in it as well. And it's got this handy little bit on the top to keep all your glugs and all that sort of thing. So that's a nice bait bag with loads of pockets on the outside as well. And then this last one, incorporates these speed pockets so you can put all your pop-ups and all that sort of thing inside there and that's a lovely one if you're going to go stalking you can probably get all the bits in there and get to everything you need really really quickly and then if you're not a barrow man like me then rucksacks have got to be the thing this is a 50 litre and a 75 litre and the nice thing about these they sit really well on your back they've got loads of outside pockets and the worst thing in a, in a rucksack is trying to get into the bottom trying to get these bits out of the bottom they've cured that by having a zip around that you basically lie it on its side, open it up and you can get into everything. So really, really good design. And if that's not big enough for all your kit, then you're taking too much with you. And when it comes to rod holders, Darwin have got pretty much everything covered from virtually no protection to full protection. So looking at the quiver, very, very lightweight, takes four made up rods, no actual protection for the rods, but some people do like that. The old A-Lite overnight bivvy's gone straight into that as well, along with a landing net, and it's got pockets on the other side for your bank sticks and everything. So if you're doing quick overnighters or just day sessions, that's the one for you. And then moving over to the rod holders, they offer a lot more protection. There's padded sleeves inside. There's an outside bit for your landing net as well. And obviously the normal pockets for your long and short rod rests. And then moving over to this fella, this is the beast of all rod bags. It will take six rods made up very ingenious thing they've got here. I'll open that up for you. There you go. So you've got three facing that way and then three facing that way. And if that's not enough, you can take three more rods without reels on as well, plus all your bank sticks. So if you're going on those long sessions and you're driving up to the back of your swim, that's got to be the one for you. 
Tracker have revamped their Armo luggage and on all of it now you've got this special Cordura material from DuPont. It's really, really hard wearing, almost indestructible. The first of the products is this Barrow bag, absolutely huge. You can see in there you can get absolutely everything you need in that main compartment. And then at the front you've got a big padded pocket for putting your buzzers in and they even supply a waterproof cover to go over the top for when it's on your Barrow. You've got padded pockets on the outside for all your bits and pieces and then at the back you've got a wet pocket so inside that there's another layer for putting all your sacks and your slings and your scales and everything like that so if they're wet the water won't get through into the main compartment and then to go with that you've got a bait bag for your frozen baits and your pop-ups and there's a little thing on the front there for other bits and pieces and then if that's not big enough for your bait or you want to take food with you then that's the one to use. Again, that's insulated and it's got another wet layer inside it. So if something spills, it won't actually get into the bag itself. And then we're on to this fella, the Armo rucksack. Absolutely huge, loads and loads of compartments, loads of different zips for keeping all your different pieces separate. So if you just want to go to one bit, you know where that little thing is, you're straight onto it. And believe it or not, these two bags come with it. So you've got one that hangs underneath it and one that goes on top of it. In there I'd put my cooking stuff and in there I've got bait and funnel web and all that sort of thing as well. You can wear the whole lot on your back or you could break it up and put it on top of a barrow. So that's the new range of Armo luggage. Let's have a look at rod bags. There are two types of rod holder in the Armo range. This is the five rod hod and the five rods go on the outside in three quarter length sleeves. And then on the inside you can get a Pioneer Ultralight an A-Lite bivvy or a Trident and then on the flip side of it you've got two different pockets for your long and short bank sticks and then this is the five rod compact quiver now the five rods again go in these three quarter length sleeves which are really easy to get the rod into they've got a zip all the way up the back so it's really easy to get the rod in and a really nice feature with this is I put my weighing handle down the spine of the centre to keep everything straight and rigid because there's nothing worse than it flopping over when you're trying to get rods on it and your landing net and everything goes on the inside there and just as with the five rod hod, you've got two pockets on the other side, one to get your bank sticks in, and that one will take your waist sling or longer sticks as well. So that's the Armo range. Now Tracker have got loads of other stuff in their range, like food bags and cutlery bags, which are really, really nice. So check out your local Tracker stockist for all of the range. Good morning, and as you've probably guessed, we've changed venues, we've left Maison and we've come over to Sky Lake, which is just east of Paris, uh, to finish off Carp Tackle Tactics and Tips. But don't worry, we're going to go back to Maison periodically, because there are some more whackers that we haven't shown you yet. And while we're here at Sky, we're going to make one of our TV shows called Thinking Tackle for Sky Sports. And literally within an hour of getting here yesterday, one of the other guys who's just turned up for a week's fishing has had a 50 pounder, and uh, an absolute stunning fish and uh, when you go up in the lodge and have a look at all the pictures of the fish in here it's quite incredible there's almost fully scales in here i think there's 15 to 20 50s in 16 acres 360s and a 70 um, and a load of nuisance 30s and 40s as well so uh, if we're very very lucky we might get one of those on the bank for you as well but for now let's get on with bite indication if you've seen any of the shows that I've done on Sky or you've seen any of the writing that I've done in the magazines, you'll know that my fishing is extremely varied. I could be fishing anything from a little tiny three acre lake in Essex somewhere to a 10,000 acre reservoir in France where you're fishing out 300 metres and there's loads of drag on the line. And there's really only one buzzer that's going to cope with all those situations and that is the Delkin. Now the Delkin has got a patented vibration system so it doesn't work like most other buzzers that have got a roller. It's actually the line moving over a ceramic V that causes a vibration and makes the buzzer go off. The Delkin hasn't got any moving parts and that's one of the reasons I moved over to it from a roller buzzer. I didn't know that was the reason at the time but basically in a fishing situation I'd had some freaky weather, it had rained really hard and then it went really really cold and my roller buzzers froze. And then in the morning I got a take and because the roller had frozen solid I wasn't getting any bleeps on the buzzer at all. I still managed to get the fish in but from then on I vowed I'd never have that situation happen to me again. So that's why I moved over to them. 
coupled with the fact I went fishing with a guy called Sean Harrison who's a fantastic angler and he was using Delkims and little tiny light bobbins and he was getting indications that I simply wasn't getting and that was the second reason for moving over to him. The range of sensitivity is huge and a lot of people have said to me oh Delkims are too sensitive but if you turn them down to the minimum sensitivity you might need two inches of movement on the line to get one bleep so when you're fishing in those really stormy conditions on the big venues they're still not going off if you've got heavy enough bobbin and then at the other end of the spectrum you can use a little tiny light bobbin have it on maximum sensitivity and they go off on minute movements of the line and they don't only indicate a run they'll indicate how fast the fish is going so basically the faster it goes the faster the buzzer will actually warble at you as well and the other thing about a vibration system is if the fish is clever enough to pick the bait up hook itself and not run and you're getting any tremors down the line the delkin will carry on going off where a roller buzzer would just stop delkin has been going over 30 years now and any of you old school anglers will know that Dell used to convert the heron buzzers and then went on to doing optonics which eventually he wasn't allowed to do anymore and that forced him to come up with this one and thank god he did now all the buzzers are designed, tested and made in the UK and because it's a family run business every single one is tested by hand that means that they're able to give you a two year guarantee on the buzzer and they've got fantastic after sale service. So if anything ever goes wrong, which is highly unlikely, you can just send it back to them, they'll repair it in a couple of days and it'll get straight back to you and nobody else can offer that sort of service. So let's have a look at the features that are common to all Delkims. First of all, the twin LEDs. Having them either side of the rod means whatever side you're sitting, you can still see the LED go off. They come in six different colours, they're extremely bright. I have yellow, green and red, which is quite unusual. Most people have the same colour in all their rods, but I like to know which one's going off in the night. And then on these TXIs, there's a plus and minus setting, which basically means how much vibration it takes to start the buzzer going. So the plus is very, very sensitive and the minus is not so sensitive. So if you're using braided reel line which has got no stretch, you need to have them on the minus and you don't have to have them set on six all the time. That's the thing a lot of people do wrong. They have them on, on the plus, on maximum sensitivity and they're going off at the slightest movement. I, you know, if I'm fishing on these big reservoirs, I might have them on sensitivity number one and on the minus setting so it takes maybe two inches of line before I get a bleep and then they're not going off when it's really, really windy. The tone and volume are also really easy to adjust and on the tone setting there's one of them that's just that little bit louder than all the others for some reason. It's between 5 and 6 in the high tone range and it just seems that little bit more piercing. Now in contrast some people like having them on the low tone because it sounds so different and if you're all sitting in one swim you know it's your rods that are going off. And on the volume they go down to nothing and I mean nothing. I mean you couldn't hear them if you were more than a couple of feet away from your rods. And some people like that because they don't want other people to know they're getting takes. Or if you're fishing in the edge and you're getting liners, you don't want a really loud buzzer because you might be spooking the fish away from the edge. In the other end of the spectrum, they're extremely loud and you can probably hear them 20, 30 yards away if you've got them on maximum volume. There are quite a few buzzers in the range now. I use the TXI, so let's have a look at the features of those. The thing that makes the TXI different to all the other buzzers in the range is that little fella there, that's the antenna. Now on the local setting the receiver's got 50 metres range and on the distance setting it's got 300 metres range. Now Delkin we're not saying be 300 metres from your rods but some of the waters I fish in France I can be 50, 60, 70 metres away from my rods just by the sheer nature of the lake. Your rods are down in the mud, you bivvy it up back in the trees and you do need that range from time to time. Now the other thing that's really good about this one is the nightlight marking. There's four different settings for brightness of LEDs and actual nightlight marking which means the LEDs come on really really faint and they're on all the time. Now I don't use it like that but some people do and they say it's brilliant if you're fishing a long way from your rods on these big French lakes you can look out in the dark or in the pouring rain and you see those four little night lights one on each rod and you know that the buzzers are on. There's nothing worse than sitting miles from your rod and thinking did I turn that buzzer on or not. Now that's the receiver. You've got six colours of LEDs on that so if you wanted to fish six different colours on your rods you could, you could do that and you can also program four rods into one colour so effectively if you wanted them all on the blue one you could have all four rods on the blue one or you could have 24 rods programmed into one buzzer which is a bit excessive I think three is enough for me. The other thing about all Delkims is the battery life I can't actually remember the last time I put a battery in one of the heads and the receiver believe it or not on the local setting which is up to 50 meters range has got 6,000 hours of battery life which is quite incredible. You'll know with some of the other buzzers a set of batteries last a weekend in your receiver so that's quite unusual to get that amount of battery life. 
The other thing about these new ones is they've got a vibration alert as well, so you can put them underneath your pillow and that will wake you up as much as the sound will. Now, if you don't do the amount of varied fishing that I do and fish all those different situations, you don't need the one with all the whistles and bells on it and there are other ones in the range that will suit any budget, so let's have a look at those now. If you don't need the cordless remote system, then the Delkin Plus will do everything that a TXI does. It's available in all six colours. It's got the night-night marking as well. It's got all your adjustments for tone sensitivity and volume. And then if you want to build it into a cordless remote system, then the TX Plus box can be bought at a later date. That just pushes on the bottom, buy your receiver, and you're away. And that brings us on nicely to the EV Plus. It's the most cost-effective buzzer that Delkin have ever done. It's push button on and off, it's still got night light marking on it, it's still got adjustments for tone sensitivity and volume, and you can also put the TX Plus box onto it as well to turn it into a cordless remote system at a later date. If you're just getting into carp fishing, that's got to be the one to go for. Highly reliable and very affordable. Delkim also do night light bobbins which glow exactly the same colour as the buzzer when it actually goes off and you'll notice my bobbins are really tiny, very very lightweight, they're made by a guy called Muddy that started in a garage just like me and he's got a fantastic range now, so let's have a look at bobbins. It's always nice to be able to tell a story about someone that starts up in their garage, makes a few products to suit their own fishing, everybody else sees them, you know, and the company explodes on the scene. And that's exactly what happened with Muddy Waters, just the same as when I started Calder. We saw his bobbins, really liked the look of them, we all got on them, the word spread, and now virtually every top angler in the country is using them. So to talk you through the range, the ones I've got on there, the ones that you'll see in most of the programs that I make, are the old school bobbins. They're the very lightest one. The clear ones weigh only two grams, the bobbin. These white ones weigh three grams. And the thing about having really light, light bobbins on is you're able to get the line sunk on the bottom of the lake. And from doing all the underwater filming, we've seen just how important it is to get everything flat on the bottom. So during this whole session and the session at May's on, I was fishing with a flying back clad and a back clad and a very, very light bobbin with some drop on it. And that's something that a lot of people do wrong. They fish the bobbins right up at the top. The lines are bowstring tight out to the rig. And we've seen from filming the underwater films that most of that line is off the bottom, which makes it very, very easy for the fish to see it. So by combining the flying back lead and the back lead and the very light bobbin, you're keeping everything on the bottom. So when the fish come into the baited area, there's no line to spook them out of the way. I've got my old school bobbins attached to six inch chains. That's the standard length. And those chains are available in four different options. You've got the light coloured chain with two different coloured ends and the dark coloured chain with two different coloured ends as well if you want to be all ultra cult about it. And they also do a longer chain, a nine inch chain, because that's what Terry Earn uses and everybody wants what Terry Earn uses. And then you can get chunky chains as well in the same four options. And then a very, very lightweight cord as well. Weighs absolutely nothing. And Muddy's just done me a set of those up with the very, very light old school clears on the top of them. That weighs about three grams, the whole thing. So if I'm fishing really close in and I'm slack lining, those are the ones to use. And then moving over to the heads, obviously you've got the old school, which are the tiniest ones. And then the lights, ever so slightly heavier, the standard, and then the long range bobbin. And that white one weighs 20 grams with nothing on it at all. And when I'm fishing the really big pits, I've got a great big solar weight underneath that as well. And the other thing, that makes these different from any other bobbin is the clips, the kipper clips at the top of them. Now you can use them like a normal clip, you just literally pull that bit of rubber up to adjust your tension, or you can take that bit of rubber out of the way and you can actually pull the line into that little V. So the bobbin itself is sort of semi-fixed on the line. So as the line moves forward, the bobbin moves forward as well, not just up, but forward. So you can see, if you're fishing for little tiny twitches, you can see how much the lines actually pull forward rather than the bobbin just rising. So that's a nice little trick you can use. If you're fishing for finicky fish, that will definitely get you more on the bank. Muddy also specialises in a fantastic range of isotopes and they are the brightest isotopes I have ever seen. They come in a full range of colours to suit all the different coloured heads. They suit all your Delkims as well, so you've got purple and blue in that range as well. And to go with it, he does baiting needles and nut drills that take isotopes as well, so you can find them in the dark. And if you fish these bobbins how I've suggested and you just increase the size of the bobbin or the weight of the bobbin to suit the wind conditions and how far out you're fishing, you will never get another false bleep.